Section 3, Chapters 7 through 9. In this section, Klee and I discuss how, as an artist, it's important to say yes until you can say no, and know what it is to say yes to. We talk about five important things to remember as creatives, and the fact that we were all born creative geniuses. We also expand on trying new things to set boundaries, the unique elevator pitch, and the innate creativity that lives in all of us. Okay, so let's talk about say yes until you can say no, which you say in the beginning you think is both some of the best and worst advice you had ever heard to date. I personally love say yes until you can say no. I think I always kind of have, but it means different things to different people. Yes. So for some people, it means like say yes to everything until you have acquired so much money that you can basically flip the bird to anyone you want to, right? right? And for some people, it means like say yes until you're in such high demand that you can start turning people away and fending them off with a stick, which in essence, those things are kind of the same thing, but that's not exactly what you're getting at here is it no the documentary that we were watching and there was a an artist on there and he his advice was like you know just say yes until you can say no and what he meant was pander to the gatekeepers pander to the people that are around you until you're so popular that that you can start like being an actor for example you got to come up the ranks you got to pay your dues you got to have your rite of passage and then once you're tom hanks you can basically do what you want right that's kind of what he was getting at yeah i think that that's horrible advice right because <laughs> like that means that you're saying yes to something even though you know definitely that you don't want to do it but you're doing it because you want to get in good with whatever crowd it is that's there right Whereas when I was saying like, it's actually the, it is the best and the worst advice. If you're looking at it as something where you have to make sacrifices in order to get ahead, then it's really bad advice. Sure. In my opinion, if you're looking at it as you are maybe being approached with something that you've never done before. And so it's outside of your comfort zone. And so your knee jerk response is to say no. Like, no, no, that's that's out of my wheelhouse. There's no way I could do that. In my mind, I'm like, no, just say yes. And then allow yourself the room to be able to figure it out and do it and show yourself that, yes, you can do this thing. And most importantly, show yourself if you really don't like doing it or not. Absolutely. Because a lot of times I think that when it comes to insecurity, a lot of insecurity is behind the idea or, or behind the fact that like maybe you feel like something is out of your wheelhouse or maybe you feel like, well, I don't I don't I don't know about that thing. And you've made up your mind about it. But really, it's more about your fear. Most well, definitely. Or in my case, like the example that I give in the book is, uh, you know, I had somebody come up to me and ask me about doing a seascape painting mm -hmm. right and they asked me about doing seascape painting and just on principle i was like i don't do seascapes right and the reason that i had come up with that whole i don't do seascapes is because when i first started my art career here a lot of artists their advice was the only thing that sells is seascapes and this and that right we're a coastal town you yeah. gotta you gotta cater to the coastal crowd and the touristy theme yeah exactly so like that was the only thing that sold and i was like well i don't want to do those things and so like it was almost like i was indignant you know if you dug somebody, your heels in a little exactly i dug my heels in a little bit just on principle not i had never tried to do a seascape in my style and the way that I wanted to. I didn't. I, I still don't want to create the stuff that other people create here. Right, because it wouldn't be yours. Because it wouldn't be mine. So, like, somebody approached me, and I remember my, my knee-jerk response was to be like, how dare you? You know, like, I didn't say that out loud, but I thought <laughs> it. And, uh, and then immediately afterwards, I was like, well, you know, I've never actually tried to do one. So I told her, listen, I'll do a seascape. Um, but I'm going to do it in my style. So it's not going to look like the stuff that's out there. And, and she said, yeah, of course, that's why I'm coming to you. Cause I want, I want a Rafi work of art, but I, I love the colors of the sea. So I ended up creating a series, uh, that I never thought I would create. And it's based on a seascape, 
uh, something that I had dug my heels in and said that I wouldn't do. So yeah, say yes until you could say no. And conversely, you have taken on in the early days, you had taken on some commissions for the experience and you had learned very quickly that it was not your bag. It was not what you wanted to do. And you really knew that while when you were eyeballs deep in it, like this is the worst. This Ex- is just the worst. Exactly. And I mean, and that's, that's what it comes down to with uh, not only commissions, but with opportunities. How do you know that I've heard people say, well, I can't I can't do a market show or I, I, I don't know enough about doing online. You talk yourself out of doing something before you actually try it instead of just trying it and figuring out if you like it or not. You never know if you're actually going to like doing something or tasting something unless you actually taste it. And then figure out like, yes, I, oh, actually I do like this or no, I don't ever want to do this again. Yeah. The food example that you offer up in the book is a great example because, you know, some foods, they look a little creepy, Yeah. Um, but you might be missing out on a good experience. Now, I, I love this because personally, I would say 95, maybe higher percent of the things that I know how to do are experiential. Because I said yes to something that I didn't know how to do at the time, even though I was terrified and fear would be the reason for me, not even indignance. Right. Fear would be the reason why I would say, oh, no, I'm sorry, I don't do that type of thing. And then I would cry or look sad or look serious and say to you, but I don't know how to do it. And maybe your dad can show me how to do this. And you were like, how do you think my dad figured out how to do that? Like he mu- he messed up 10 of them and then got the 11th one right. He figured it out as he went. And so for me, it was like saying yes and being transparent also, you know, like maybe it's a matter of letting the person know, like, this will be the first time I do this. So like, if you're in for this ride, keep your hands and arms inside the cart. Um, But then going ahead and trying it and coming out the other end and saying, well, I'm never going to do that again. Or, you know, this is actually something that I can do. Exactly. And I'm going to get better at it. Exactly. And you get to figure it out. Or even if you even if it's like totally you totally failed at it and you did horribly in the process, figuring out like, OK, well, maybe this is something that I could keep practicing at. I really want to challenge myself to be able to do this. And I think that a lot of the say yes uh, to certain commissions or uh, shows or any opportunities that open up has more to do with for me, the challenge of it, like I want to walk away from this knowing that I can do this thing Mm -hmm. and determine to myself whether or not I actually enjoy it or I'm avoiding it because I'm scared and, or do I just not now it's not my bag. I don't want to do it. And the only way to really know that is to actually go and do it and work through the insecurities because that's what's going to happen when you take on something that maybe you're insecure to get started. Mm -hmm. You are going to face every single insecurity and roadblock that caused you to want to say no in the first place. You're basically going to go through the the 12 stages of grief only. It's like the the 12 stages of denial that you're actually going to do this thing. Yep, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) And on the flip side of that coin, then also being willing to say no because you know it's not your bag. It's not something that resonates with you even if it's lucrative, even yes. if the money, the money grubbing side of your brain is like, you need to take that. Like, you'd be a fool not to take that. And you're like, nope, it's not. It's not me. Yeah. I know it's not me. Yeah. That and that 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 is something that is really, really important, because basically a lot of people, uh, you know, we go back to the whole neat niche marketing thing Mm -hmm. where people want to niche themselves because it's easy to market themselves or like a marketing course. They want you to niche yourself. And the fact of the matter is a lot of times they have certain niches picked out Mm -hmm. and they're like, which one do you fit into? And so a lot of people will force them to do something because they know that it might be more lucrative than something else. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, it's like the mindset, well, at least you're making money. Well, yeah, you're making money, but for that, you might as well just go and work some job 
that you're creating something that you don't really want to create in the first place. Absolutely. So me being in the jewelry art category, um, I, you know, some of the advice I've gotten is like, you got to do watch repair. Like you just just do watch repair and do like this type of repair. That's your bread and butter. That's how you're going to pay the bills. So you can do your like little creative things on the side. And I was like, but I don't, I don't really want to do watch repair. I don't really want to change watch batteries. Like maybe it would be lucrative, but like, that's not where my heart is at. Right. <laughs> so I'm going to have to figure out a different way other than watch repairs. I mean, that's what I had to uh, figure out for myself because of the way that I grew up. You know, I grew up in the jewelry business and I can't tell you how many thousands upon thousands of times I've heard every single member of my family who is a jeweler say, your bread and butter is in the repairs. Your bread and butter is in the repairs. And in my mind, I'm like, wait a second, but that's not really, uh, that's not really equating here because I'm seeing people that are very successful and they're designing jewelry Yeah. and they're the ones that have their names out there. And their bread and butter is definitely not repairs. Their bread and butter is designing jewelry. It's the same thing as looking at a seamstress versus a clothing designer. Right. Or an art restoration expert versus the artist. Exactly. And there's absolutely merit in any side of that. Oh, yeah. The people who repair the stuff, uh, kudos. That's an awesome skill to have. I mean, if you're able to repair jewelry, then you're able to create jewelry. And I'm not saying, again, we go back to the roads. It doesn't mean that you have to pick one or the other. Absolutely. I do repairs. Because there is a benefit there. But to basically niche yourself as one thing and say, well, this is where... This is where I make the bulk of my money. Right. And not understanding that like all of it it involves creativity. It's one of the things that we go through now, like even writing the book, doing our music, uh, doing YouTube videos, stuff like that. The bulk of the money that we make, ironically enough, comes from the art. Right. So anything that I do that is not art, like recording this right now, almost seems like a waste of time. But it's not because it's still a creative thing that I want to do. And I think that that's where that that separation comes in. If you start taking repairs as the bulk of your money, then what ends up happening is that your design work kind of falls to the wayside. It suffers. Yeah. Yeah. And even getting into production mode, as we like to call it where you're just doing this thing that you know is producing income, and that's awesome. Produce the income. But um, if your creative self is suffering for it, then you have to find a way to strike a balance. Yeah, absolutely. We all want to make money, but do not make money at the sacrifice of your creative side because your creative side was what caused you to make the money in the first place. Yeah. And like, And if you want to grow, then you're going to have to invest – time into things that don't seem lucrative right away and that's where having a a long slow burn mindset comes in because a lot of the things that we do may not produce income right away but you don't know where you're going to be in 10 years or 20 years it it just it's going to keep growing and the more that you produce the the more outcome a uh, positive outcome is going to come from it versus stifling this side of you because it's not making money. And that's where, like I talk about, you're either chasing money or you are just living the life of a creative. And that way you can say yes and no from an authentic place. Exactly. I never thought I would be sitting here part of a YouTube channel recording audiobook commentary. I mean, even when you were first meeting me, I was somebody who said, well, public speaking is just not in my wheelhouse. I don't communicate well on, in that way. Um, it's just not something that I would ever do. And yep. here I sit. Yep. <laughs> From a totally different place, having experienced all I've experienced. I mean, that's the thing. Like, a lot of times, had you decided that this was just not something that was in your wheelhouse and you were not willing to say yes... You would not and go through the awkward moments, super awkward, uh, super awkward moments and failing miserably and feeling like you said the wrong things and doing all the those things. I had somebody recently comment and say that, um, wow, you know, you're so natural up there. And I'm like, well, it did it. Maybe you want to call it natural, but check it out took, some of the older videos. Yeah, it took like 10 years for me to get this natural, you know, like <laughs> it, it's it. 
it takes time and it's all about making sure that you are chasing the creativity that is within you and not just chasing a buck. Because if you're chasing a buck, then you're putting the creativity to the side. And so that's where we and we're talking from experience, from going through production mode and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. No, you know, absolutely. This is experience talking and, and, because we have chased the buck at times. And taking and taking commissions that w- didn't want to do, mm-hmm. but we did it because there was a nice big fat price tag on it. And then realizing that was way more work than it needed to be because this sucked and this is not something that I'm going to do again. So yeah, say yes until you could say no. I love it. And so uh, next I want to talk about, you have a list here of five things to remember as a creative. And I like this breakdown and it starts off with the art market and how confusing the art market is and what are we actually talking about here? And you make reference to um, rock star artists smearing feces on a picture of a Smurf and selling it for a million dollars, which, by the way, you can't unsee that once no. you've seen that in your mind's eye. No. No. Um, meanwhile, You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> meanwhile, you've got people that are trying to do their thing. You know, it's, it's not about the shock value um, which feces on a Smurf, I feel like that's, that's shock value. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but like for, for the rest of us, uh, some principles to live by, I think. And I really like this, this bullet point list, which I just kind of wanted to go over quickly yeah. and maybe add some stuff in, um, self promote an artist self promotes. And I would like to add, and I think you would definitely concur Don't be ashamed of that. So many of us are taught to feel ashamed of self-promotion. They even call it shameless self-promotion. And I am a big fan of shameless self-promotion because what that ultimately means is that you are putting something out there and you are excited about what you're putting out there. And so you want to tell everybody about it uh, versus holding back from telling people the thing that you're most excited about. And I I think that a lot of people that listen to this are going to relate to the story of you being a young kid and going somewhere and a parent turning to you and saying, don't ask for anything. Mm-hmm. Or and don't speak out of turn. Don't speak out of turn. And a lot of times, you know, we were punished for uh, boasting Right. That's what it was called. It was called boasting. Mm -hmm. Right. And the fact of the matter is that if you're excited about what you do and you want to share it with the world, then you could call that boasting if you want. But all that is, is sharing your excitement. And I think it's just having that different mindset of it, like definitely self-promote. Talk about yourself. Be excited about what you're doing. There is absolutely and completely nothing wrong with that. It doesn't have anything to do with self-promoting. I've heard people use the term narcissistic so much. And whenever I read what it is that they're talking about, I'm like, I don't think you know what it means to be a narcissist. You know, like there, there is so much that gets discouraged about talking about yourself in a positive light that it just doesn't make any sense to me. If you're excited about your life and excited about what you're doing, tell people about it. That's all self-promoting is. Absolutely. And honestly, it's that excitement and that joy that I feel like people are drawn to that. Yeah. Like no one ever said, I'm so captivated by your shame and your bashfulness (laughs) when it comes to... And we all face shame and bashfulness because of exactly what you've been talking about, where we're taught to feel ashamed of it. But I think there's a really distinct difference between boasting and... And being excited about what you're doing. Boasting doesn't come from a genuine place. No. And and being excited does. Yeah. And so... And it, I mean, and that's... that's it, I think it's, it's not making that distinction that caused a lot of... It, there are times out there where I'm talking to an artist and I want to I wanna see their stuff. I want to see what they've done. 
and it's almost like pulling teeth. And I'm like, come on, just you're you're I'm asking you about this. Just tell me already. Open the floodgates. Yeah, open the floodgates. Let it go. Let me know what you're excited about. Let's do this. Let's have this conversation. And they're sitting there and I think that there's this confusion. They think that it means being humble. Right. You know, and being humble is, for example, you and I have maybe at the time of this recording 20,000 something followers on YouTube. We've made this career for 10 years. We've come out in newspapers. We've come out in all these things, right? Right? That sounds like I'm I'm boasting at this point. Like we've done all these things and I've won awards and blah blah blah. Being humble is realizing that none of that crap means anything. Yeah, we're still it, just two dots on a larger dot. Exactly. We're we're not we're not famous. I'm not any better as an artist or even as a human being than anyone else out there. Like there is nothing that sets me apart from somebody who is just starting their career to, uh, to, to being an artist for 60 years. We're just people that are creative that are out there. That's what it means to be humble. Being humble does not mean that you just don't, let people know what you're excited about. Absolutely, which goes beautifully into the next thing that you say here, which is to be confident, but also be willing to grow, meaning be confident in what you're doing, but also understand that there's always room for improvement. Yeah. Just because we have uh, however many followers on YouTube doesn't mean that we can't grow and improve and learn or at your skill level as an artist that you're that you're um, done. That yeah. you've made it and that's it. No, we are we are constantly evolving. We are constantly there is always room for improvement. Um the the thing about it is that so with artists, uh and and I know this because I've experienced this, with artists, we are a very, very insecure bunch, right? Yeah, usually. Because what are we doing? We're creating stuff on our own and then if we want to, we share it out there. And then we bite our fingernails, hoping that we get some kind of positive response, hoping that we definitely don't get any kind of negative response or hoping that we at least get some kind of response. Yep. You know, and we're sitting there and we're constantly questioning, are our prices too high? Are our prices too low? Is my piece any good? Why is nobody looking? You know, like we are so insecure that the moment that any kind of little tiny bit of success comes in, right? Um, we use that almost as like a shield of honor. I was going to say exactly like a shield. Yeah, we use it as a shield of honor. I am an award winning artist. I have won multiple awards at this point because I just won one the other day. Well, what was it? It was a merit award. You know what? It's kind of cool because it's actually not just a ribbon. <laughs> so <laughs> like, but at the same time, like it doesn't mean anything. You see all this stuff. Um, out there because that's the way that marketing uh, promotes things you know like you get award-winning restaurants well what does that mean it means some dude went in there and ate and they were like yeah it's pretty good we like it yeah you know like so like you get all of these things are based on accolades and education and you know uh, whether or not this person is an expert or not in something and really when it comes down to it we're all just figuring things out and none of us have reached the pinnacle of anything. Absolutely. And I think these awards and accolades and life experience points and leveling up in your uh, magical powers is awesome. Yeah. We should always be striving to be more. Yeah. Uh, but understanding that we're still all just a bunch of humans. We're all just a bunch humans. of humans. I think the problem there is when you start comparing yourself to others, and that's where it's important to to follow that rule. Absolutely. So the third thing, and I, I this is going to be fun to talk about, um, socialize. Socialize with uh, potential art collectors. Socialize with other art. Socialize, and I have here, however you can. Yeah. Um, because time, times right now, they are a challenging as far as socializing with others. And um, socializing can be one of the most scary, daunting things for an artist. I can't tell you how many artists I've heard say, I just, I can't, I can't people. I yeah. just, I yeah. don't like people. They don't understand me. I don't know how to whatever. 
I've heard myself say variations on that. And me, myself, uh, I've come to realize that it's not that I don't like people. It's not that I can't deal with people. It's not that I don't know how to interact with people. It was that I was afraid people wouldn't like me. And I was generalizing people. And really, I was just scared of being myself. And the idea that I can't socialize is more the idea that, oh, I can't be my authentic self. And so this is going to be exhausting. Right. And I've realized that's true. That is exhausting to not be your authentic self. What is most important that I think a lot of people overlook when they're talking about that is the authenticity of you being you. You putting yourself out there as you. You don't need to be any different. Get out there and bumble around. Make mistakes. You don't have to say everything perfectly. You don't have to use art speak. You don't have to do any of that stuff that you think it means to be portrayed as an artist. You just got to go out there and be yourself in the best possible version of you, which is just being you that there is. And that is the least exhausting way to socialize. If you are out there thinking that you need to put up a front, that's exhausting. Yeah, it absolutely is. Or out there thinking like, well, I just don't get along with people. Well, surely you haven't met them all. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. There There are a lot of people in the world and We've done so many things, and there are people that we just immediately click with, and then there are people that just it do, the connection doesn't happen. Yeah. Or I wish I would have said that better, knowing okay, well I'll say that better the next time, and it's it's fine, it's all fine. Like you're gonna meet people, and it's gonna be an awesome experience, and you're gonna meet people, and it's gonna be an experience you won't remember, and they won't remember. You're gonna meet people, and it's gonna be a not so good experience. And you don't have to, like, hit it off with every person you ever meet and be on, as they call it. I think what happens is that uh, in a lot of society, what we're taught is, you know, I'm sure everybody's, you know, first impressions are very important, you know. So, Mm -hmm. like, a lot of us stress out about leaving a first impression. And basically, our communication with anyone else has everything to do with with what kind of impression we're leaving on the other person. And in fact, you know, you'll have a conversation and then you'll walk away and you'll be like, oh man, I said this and I probably sounded stupid to so-and-so. So like a lot of people are so focused on what the other person, what their imagination is telling them that the other person thinks about them when chances are the other person is thinking about what you think of them probably. in the first place. You know, and really what it comes down to it is like every interaction is an opportunity for you to just be yourself and deal with the rejection. Mm -hmm. Let's say that some people aren't going to be your people. Yeah. You're going to meet some people out there and you don't, you know, we live in a very people pleaser society. So we want everyone to like us. And so if that means that we have to put on a false front in order for that person to like us. Then we're going to go out there and we're going to, you know, behave a certain way and and say things that maybe we don't necessarily agree with. And the truth of the matter is that, like, that kind of stuff is what makes interaction exhausting. So, like, the idea of going somewhere where you're meeting several people, that's exhausting because how many people are you going to have to play? Right. So you might as well just be you. You're strange, weird, aloof crazy, gloriously awkward, gloriously awkward, clumsy self and just go out there and have fun being you. It is so freeing once you're able to get out there and not give a rip about what anyone else might think of you, because that's that's what causes a lot of that insecurity, a lot of that social awkwardness, a lot of getting out there and 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 almost freezing up. And having the inability, we've experienced that so much with so many of the shows that we've done and different events that we've gone. And it's always been really, really interesting to me to figure it out. And and the thing is, what's important here is you're going to go to an event. You're going to freeze up. Mm -hmm. If you walk away from that event and you punish yourself because you're like, God, I screwed up. I blah, blah, blah. I should have done this or I should have this. You know, you just start shitting on yourself. Um, You're not going to get anywhere. It's understanding like, oh, I went to this event. Ooh, that's so weird. Like I froze up. 
why did why did that happen? And then getting in a little bit deeper, like when we went to uh, one of the the high end black tie events, like I was not I was totally awkward and did not talk to anyone. And I realized later on that the reason I didn't do it was because I had this different understanding of the fact that everybody there was extremely wealthy and I felt less than. Mm hmm. And so, like, l walking away from that experience and realizing, wait a second, next time that there is any kind of event like that, I'm just going to be me. My, Absolutely. My crazy me. Like, I was worried that they were going to think I was, like, some hillbilly or something like, you know, like, I, I don't know what it was that I was thinking. And when I thought back, I was like, oh, that's that's actually an insecurity that I got from my dad. Mm-hmm. And like, really, like you take those opportunities and you really investigate why it is. I wasn't worried about what they thought of me after the fact, because I was like, well, that's not going to do me any good. I need to figure out why I behave the way that I behaved and how can I improve? And, and was I happy with the way that I behaved? Because that's what's really most important there. It's not, did I behave in a way that was socially acceptable? Is was I happy with my behavior? And if I'm not, then I'm going to investigate it. I'm going to say like, okay, well, next time I could do this a little bit better. Not to make a good impression on them, but so that you feel comfortable and happy and in have social fun. settings. Have fun. It's a social gathering. You get to go there and, and make up stories and, and, and see whatever the situation is and have as much fun as you possibly can because... It's an experience. It's a life experience. And you get to either enjoy it or be miserable at it. But really, it's up to you. That's that's perfect. Um, OK, let's talk about the elevator pitch, because in this section, you mentioned the elevator pitch. Yes. And I've always struggled with the elevator pitch, probably because I'm a self-proclaimed over explainer. <laughs> so the elevator pitch is supposed to be pretty concise. <laughs> and um, right. And so Why? Why have an elevator pitch? So the idea behind the elevator pitch is to actually make it easier on yourself. And unfortunately for some people, uh, they may, it makes it harder for them because they overthink it. The elevator pitch is to give you a go-to for when someone asks you the typical question, what do you do? Sure. And your uh, response is, um... yeah, because a lot of times, especially as artists, people ask us what we do. And then if you just say, well, I'm an artist, usually the question that follows that is what kind of art do you create? Mm -hmm. You know, because it, and for me personally, like my elevator pitch is broken into several sections. Right. So if they're like, uh, what do you do for a living? I tell them I'm an artist. And what kind of art do you create? Uh, I create Rafi art. It's my art. And they're like, what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, you know, I create very emotionally charged pieces that are meant to empower, empower people out there uh, to be strong and powerful. It's it's they're meant to be a reminder. So it's, it's not even so much a pitch per se, because you're not going to walk into an elevator, as an example, and right. be like, hi, I'm Rafi. I create emotionally charged art. Right. It's more of like a, here's what I'm going to say if asked or if the opportunity presents itself. On the same token as like, uh, you know, something happened. I didn't know what to say at the moment. I wish I would have said this. This is what I'm going to say next time. Right. Kind of deal. Right. Exactly. And it's called an elevator pitch because I didn't invent it. It's something that's out there already. And I found it to be very, very helpful as long as you are being playful about the elevator pitch. And that might have been a little tidbit that I could have added into the book, which is the elevator pitch is not meant to be stressful. I, I thought it was implied because obviously my book is very playful mm -hmm. with these things, but the elevator is not meant to be stressful. The elevator is equivalent to standing up and saying, hi, my name is Rafi and I like to take long walks on the beach and I love to gaze at the stars mm -hmm. like that, that right there, that, that is something that if somebody asked you like, what kind of things do you love doing? Well, you've got it. You've got your elevator pitch. That's it. Yeah. So don't take it so seriously. Especially knowing that when somebody asks you, what do you do or what do you like? They really don't care. 
it's true. They're just waiting to tell you what they do. Exactly. Most likely. We recently played around with the idea of telling people, uh, well, we have fun for a living mostly. And then I might chime in with, it's a lot to manage. Luckily, we have protocols in place to help manage the fun. Yep, exactly. Um, and see what, what kind of response that might glean in social settings. <laughs> <laughs> have fun with it. And be as authentic as you can muster, I yeah. think, are good things to remember. Absolutely. The next one is invest in your business and pay your taxes, which I love. And first off, invest in your business came easily and naturally for me because I love rocks yes. and metals. And I love to buy them and I would be buying them anyway. So it works out for me that they are a business investment. But I've met a lot of artists who feel so guilty spending their hard-earned money on more art supplies and i'm like dudes that makes absolutely no sense to me whenever i run into somebody who feels i actually feel guilty spending money on myself you when know, it's like, not art yeah, related when it comes to like buying clothes and things like that like i feel i i would much rather i love buying art supplies i buy art supplies in bulk I will spend more money on art supplies. Basically, it, it's a lot of times, especially towards the beginning, I was like, okay, how much money do we need for the bills? Boom, that's set aside. Oh, wow, I've got this much left. Basically, that entire amount... Is gone today. It's gone today. It's I'm gone. getting on there yeah. and buying the things. It, there was even no no worry of like, do I have enough money for bills next month? I, I didn't even concern myself with that because I was like, in my mind, I'm like, the more art supplies I buy the more stuff I'll be able to create and sell. So the more money I will make. And really there's, I buy so many art supplies that there, I have enough art supplies in the studio that I would not have to buy art supplies for the next year. This is true. This is definitely true. Well, I love that you say that invest in your business, obviously not just art supplies, but in whatever it is that your business needs. It's like having a garden. Yeah. Uh, so tend to it. And, and buy buy some books on art. Buy some, some new materials that you've never used before. Uh, you know, purchase the the thing, the, the, the new equipment that you want for your business. Absolutely. Take the class that you really want to take. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that, that about covers it. Um, you also go on to mention, you know, pay your taxes when you start to make the monies. Yep. Maybe hire a bookkeeper. These are all things speaking from experience. You yes. know, the whole legality side of the business can seem really daunting. But if you just take those steps, reach out to the people you need to reach out to to help you make it happen. It's really not that bad. And um, you'll be glad you did because you want to have all that stuff in order so that you don't have to think about it. So yeah. That you can focus on and the I, art. I think what's important to emphasize here is that way you don't have to think about it because a lot of people get really stressed. They get freaked about it. First off, listen, if you're only selling like $400 a year in art, then you don't have to worry about federal taxes. Right. And in fact, you could look into your state and and take a look at like what the mandates are for uh, federal sales and even for sales tax uh, in the particular state and see like how much money do I actually have to make before I, this is required to be called a business. Mm -hmm. And that will give you some leeway in the beginning. But when it comes when you start making some money, then definitely register your business, do everything that you need to do because it will just make things a lot easier for you. Absolutely. And yes, you're going to have to pay sales tax. You're going to have to collect sales tax. You're going to have to pay federal tax on your income but that's where a tax you where you get somebody who knows what they're doing with taxes and that way you don't have to focus on it you don't have to think about it but really like this stuff should not be stuff that scares you because you have all the resources uh online i personally would much rather call someone or go to the tax office and talk to someone right then and there than to try and research the stuff online. You can research it all online, but I'm very much, I want quick answers. I'm going to go face to face. So like a lot of times I see people really, really struggling with this because they're looking at information online. And of course there is a plethora of information, Oh yeah. but it's so confusing to go through. 
just go to the tax office. Absolutely. Just go talk to somebody. And call them and be like, or like I did, I called them and I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm at a point where I need to do this. Please help. And they were very helpful. I've known a lot of artists that won't do, for those of you who might want to do shows, we learned very quickly that a lot of shows are not open to you without the tax stuff in place. Yep. You have to be able to collect and report sales tax. Uh, we found that there are some shows that like if you go and you do it, their county will come out and find out the information of the artists that have shown at that show. And then they'll get a letter saying that they need to remit so many taxes because like that they require that to be. So if you're not collecting sales tax already at that point, you're going to have to pay the sales tax. Yeah. For that show anyway. So like you're better off just if you're going to be doing like big shows and stuff like that, having all that stuff in order. If you're making good money, have all that stuff in order. And that way, trust me, the more you know about it as you're going and you don't have to like learn it all before you get started or make it this terrifying thing. But just getting into it little by little and understanding and asking the questions that you need to ask, just make it less difficult on yourself by doing that. Absolutely. And the last thing in your list of five things to remember is that you cannot fail. Yes. And I don't think we need to say much here because basically your entire book is about how you cannot fail if you just keep going. Yeah. It is impossible. And the thing about this statement uh that it is impossible to fail is actually a lesson that i learned uh several years ago before i started my art career was the realization that the only time in my life that i've ever felt like a failure the only time not not when i did something and i screwed it up or tried something new and screwed it up never felt like there was nothing long lasting about those experiences where i felt like a failure it was when i quit doing something up. when i gave up it was the only time that i felt like i failed miserably um and you know my story of like i tried I've 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 tried intermittently here and there like I'd start my art career you know while I was working but like got discouraged and even showed my stuff at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago and did all these like things and showed stuff and then took them down and then put them back up and uh basically a, a whole bunch of start and stops throughout my entire life of wanting to do this thing starting it and then quitting at the first moment that uh, things got a little bit hard mm -hmm. and every single one of those just lived on as a failure. It was just being a feeling like a failure. Having an actual failure is feeling like you let yourself down. Yes. Because you did not continue. Basically you proclaim to yourself, I need to quit this because I'm not good enough. And I want to make a distinction here because I've quit certain creative things that I was doing. I quit a couple of bands that I was in and um, I've quit doing other creative things that years ago I was involved in. Uh, some of those things I quit because it was the natural progression to do so. Some of them I quit because they were no longer good for me. They were right. actually becoming more of a like not good toxic thing. Right. Um, and, and I had Re undo regret associated with that somehow I had failed even though I walked away from this creative thing for a specific reason right. but I also think on the reverse side of that sometimes I think we trick ourselves into saying it's good for me to walk away from this uh, and we come up with all these really great reasons why when in actuality we just don't think we can do it I think I think you're right, but I also would like to add to that, particularly with your story, because I know you and I know the story. And I think that in some cases um, you need to be careful with when you are walking away. Like, for example, you walk away from a band and for you, you're like, I'm done with this band. It doesn't have anything to do with music. You weren't walking away from music. You're walking away from a band. Right. Uh, it's so like there's there's a difference there in my book. It wasn't that you were quitting uh, yourself. You're quitting this thing that was just not working for you anymore. And I think that that's important to remember in flexibility. Now, whether or not you had regret afterwards 
had more to do with the fact that maybe you thought that you weren't capable of doing the music without them. So you felt like you were walking away from the music. Yes. The real regret was that I stifled myself musically after I quit. Yeah. Uh, that was the real regret because being able to walk away from something that's not good for you, that's causing you emotional harm or distress or physical stress, even if it is a creative thing, you have to be able to do that. Yeah. And that doesn't make you a failure. For me, that was a lesson. I, I did need to walk away from this particular thing, but I didn't need to put music down entirely. And that therein was the real regret. Yeah. I think when it comes down to failure, and that's that's why it's important to really, really quantify what I mean when I say failure. It's not that you quit something. It is that you gave up on yourself. That's what failure is. When you give up on yourself, where well, you're done. Not the band. Doesn't matter. Because, like, sometimes you got to walk away from a situation. Sometimes you might be going in a direction with your art that you're like, ah, why am I doing this? I don't want to do this. And so you quit going in that direction and you change directions. Mm -hmm. If you quit altogether, then at that point, it's not the art that you're giving up on. It is yourself that you're giving up on. So it's important to really find a distinction between those. It is impossible to really truly fail unless you give up. On you. On you, yeah. That's an awesome distinction to make. And you can't fail also because you were born a creative genius. Exactly. Did you like that segue yeah. into the next? <laughs> that was good. <laughs> um, I'm, little kids. Uh, I love this section. It talks about how we are all, <laughs> well, okay, first off, you open the chapter in the best way possible where you say no one knew the creative potential that was ready to burst forth from your tiny drooling lump of a body. And um, <laughs> I just love that because we are. It's like when we're born, we're these like tiny little balls of brightness and yep. light and excitement and everything is new. And we're little wild humans. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we're pooing all over ourselves. <laughs> we don't have control we're, over we're our limbs. We're sticking all kinds of things in our mouth. We have no <laughs> no control over our head. All we kind wobble of around. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, just everything. And um, then, you know, like you get a little bit older where your motor skills kick in and you can make uh, sounds that have more to do with language. Well, uh, language that most adult humans recognize. And, yeah. Um, then you start to adapt uh, stuff that's yeah. around you, examples of things. Yeah. And um, you're like a little tiny sponge, yeah. basically. And so whatever your environment is, you just rapidly absorb that environment. Not just things that you're told, but things that you're seeing, things that you're smelling, and so on and so forth. I mean, I, I think about the fact that, like, television, TV, uh, internet now. Uh, oh, yeah neighbors people like every everybody is such a huge influence on you because you are observing the world and you are absorbing everything because nothing means anything to you yet you it's know all new. It, it's so funny because like for us a lot of times it's hard to put ourselves in that perspective but imagine going out into the yard and you're looking at trees and you don't know that they're trees you don't know that those are leaves you don't know that that thing that just blew past it is called wind or how it works. Like basically everything is brand new and magical and you're looking to the world as a reference to tell you what things are. Right. And before that, you're looking at everything with almost limitless potential. Exactly. Anything could be anything. Exactly. And that's why little kids are geniuses. And we should, I mean, they just, there's no comparison as far as like divergent thinking. When you ask a little kid to come up with uh, a dozen uses for something, they will beat you every time. Oh, absolutely. Because they're, <laughs> they're not held back by the idea that this thing is meant for this. And every time I've seen it, this is what it's used for. And this is how you use it. And this is what we do with it. it, it they don't see that. They just see endless possibilities because it's just a thing there's no label for it it's not meant for anything so at this point if it's not meant for anything it means that it's meant for everything, everything. and yeah. that uh lends itself incredibly well to art and yes. creativity yes. in general and so little kids are little creative geniuses 
And um, then they start to learn stuff like don't draw on your notebook. And I just want to take a moment here. Why have we always been told in school not to draw on our folders and not to draw on our notebooks? And I wonder if kids are still told those things. Like, is it still taboo to draw on your folders? And if so, why? Can anyone explain to me why we can't draw on our notebooks and folders? What if I take my notebook home after school and draw on it then? That was also unacceptable. In well, the, the irony there is that whenever you're talking on the phone and you are paying attention to what someone is telling you on the phone, usually you're doodling. Yeah. Usually you, if you do have a pen and paper in your hand, you're just kind of doodling and doing these weird not sketches even looking and stuff. At it. Yeah, not even looking at it. You're just doing stuff. So, like, the idea that drawing art uh, on your notebook or anything like that was is taboo just has to do with the mentality of the whether or not you're paying attention and whether or not someone has attention deficit disorder or whatever it is that they want to label right, it now. Right, every kid has some stuff going on now, according to experts. The fact of the matter is there is a lot of engaging teachers out there that really encourage creativity and have found a way to use creativity in their classes. Absolutely. Because understanding that like you cannot just memorize language. We don't learn the English language, us who live here in the United States, because we memorized words. We learned the English language because it was a situation of life and death. Yeah. If you want to get to a bathroom, well, you better learn how to say bathroom really quickly. You know, so like there, there, it's, that's one of the reasons, like, if you want to learn a new language, the best thing for you to do is drop into another country and have your fight or flight instincts come in and start adapting and learning to the situation because it becomes a life and death thing. Learning has never been about repeating and memorization. That's where, that's where the study that I talk about in the book comes in because it's like trying to use two sides of your brain at once just does not help with learning or creativity. Absolutely. So learning really comes from immersion. It's uh, engaging all the senses. You see something, you learn about it. You might learn the word that represents it. You might associate a smell with it or a sound with it. It's like a full on experience, not just memorizing text from a book. Um, the study is pretty uh, is pretty easy to understand. We basically get the creativity dumbed out of us, as you say. And here's the unfortunate thing to me about this. But I think I think actually it's unfortunate. But I think things are changing. Yes. And that's the positive is that we we learn conformity, and it starts off with being told right. And then when you're in school, for example, then other kids reinforce it. You know, if you're the weird kid, other kids are going to let you know right. that you should feel pretty bad about that, yeah. that you're the weird kid. And then pretty soon after negative reinforcement from your peers, in this case, kids in this example, Which you the start ir- to... The irony there is that those kids, their entire world was their household. Right. So like they're bringing in their world into this environment where now you're going in there with your world and all these other kids have experienced their worlds. Mm -hmm. from growing up in their households and bringing those ideals in there. So, like, you're called the weird kid. This is an epiphany to you. Right. Because you're like, wait a second, what makes me weird? And by their standards, you're the weird kid. Right. So then that's negatively reinforced by the other kids. And then pretty soon... You don't even need the other kids anymore because you start policing yourself. Yes. You basically start holding yourself to those standards because you've learned that uh, the the punishment for being the weird kid is getting endlessly picked on. So then you start basically um, making yourself conform. Yeah. Um, And that's the way a lot of stuff works. Well, yeah. It doesn't end at school. I mean, uh, the thing is that that's that's basically what you just listed off was domestication. That's how we domesticate uh, animals. Right. You know, reward and punishment, reward and punishment. At that point, you get told what you are uh, and you that gets reiterated to you. And when you try and defend yourself from that and say, no, that's not what I'm at. 
then people gang up on you, which is punishment. Mm -hmm. And basically the moment that you start to accept it more and just take it, then that's, uh, that's your reward basically. Right. You know, because then you get accepted for being this thing that you didn't want to be in the first place. And what's interesting uh, about this particular statement as well is not only the things that you're being told that you are, but it's the idea that it's in this environment, not only in in the school environment, but with your parents, that you're told what you're not. Yeah. This is where you start to really, really understand what you're not. So you thought you were cool. Nope, that's not you. You, you thought you had common sense. Nope, you don't have common sense, nope. according to every parent. <laughs> you thought you were smart. Well, guess what? You're not. And you basically get told all the things that you're not and all the things that you can't achieve. Mm -hmm. You thought you thought you were creative. You thought that you could uh, paint or that you could draw elephants really well. Well, guess what? You can't. Why? Because Timmy's elephant looks more like an elephant than your elephant. Right. Timmy gets an A plus and you get a C plus. Exactly. And so that leads to statements like, well, I'm just not right brained or I'm just not left brained. Yeah. Well, I just I just that's not how my brain works. Understanding that, well, that's a whole big kerfuffle because everyone uses both sides of their brain. Everyone uses convergent and divergent thinking to some extent. But what you say in the book and what I know to be true is that they're teaching us to do it wrong. Yeah. So George Land's uh, study they basically took and it was all the same kids throughout the study. So like they, they studied them when they were five and they found that the, the percentages of like this genius, you know, uh, divergent, convergent thinking was, was phenomenal. Like, Oh my God, all these kids are geniuses. Mm -hmm. And then they tested them five in increments of five years, five years later, five years later, and their percentages went down vastly. To, down to like 2% as adults, right? Yeah, 2% as adults. I think it was like 15% uh, or 12% when they were 15. It It is amazing. Creativity, innovation, all that stuff really does get dumbed down out of us because instead of encouraging the compartmentalized thinking in that way, utilizing those two halves as a whole, um, what ends up happening is we're forced to memorize things. Mm -hmm. So you're forced to sit there and repeat something over and over and over. You need divergent thinking for the creative ideas to innovate, to come up with new things. And you need convergent thinking to make a plan. To make it happen. To make it happen. Yeah. Uh, for chunking, uh, which we talk about a lot, is uh, convergent thinking. It's creating a way to make it happen. For any of you that don't know what for chunking is, for chunking is... Uh, five minute chunking. So basically you get started on a project and you just say, I'm just going to do it for five minutes. And then sometimes the project goes on longer or you just, after the five minutes you're done, but at least you get that started. What that allows is for you to take action on maybe some harebrained idea that you have or something that's been uh, circulating in your mind that you want to create and that's essentially what divergent and convergent thinking is. Divergent thinking is allowing yourself to reach for the stars. Whenever you watch a young kid, like when you watch a young kid, right? And they're talking about, I'm going to do this and I'm going to, I'm going to make this into this. Just leave a bunch of cardboard in a room and don't be like, I'm going to build this and I'm going to build that. And then you watch them, you watch them construct it. Mm -hmm. Right. Because basically their imagination has taken over and said, I'm going to build this uh, spaceship. And then they go and they take what is available to them at that time, even if it means, Daddy, I need you to raise this and put it over here. They're going to use everything that's available to them. And the way that that works is convergent thinking is the problem solver that makes it happen. Divergent thinking is reaching for the stars. And so, yes, at the end of it, this kid has a box set up that does maybe to the adult does not look like a spaceship whatsoever. But to them, it is a space. It is a spaceship. Absolutely. I think a uh, problem here is that a lot of times we learn to use convergent thinking to swat down the harebrained idea. Yeah. So we come up with the harebrained idea, 
uh, divergent thinking and we're like, that's great. And then we use convergent thinking to talk ourselves out of to it. label it as stupid. Yeah. And never, never going to be possible. Yeah. And yeah. see, and that's that's where a lot of people like this is one of the reasons that a lot of people feel the need to take uh, marketing courses, because if you were to understand, like, have the hairbrain, think of one thing. How can I get my stuff out there? And allow yourself to just go nuts thinking about different harebrained solutions, fun, crazy ways of putting yourself out there, right? And then you jot those down. And then you look at that list and say, I'm going to pretend like none of these are too far-fetched. How can I make this happen? And basically, you make a plan to achieve the impossible. Mm-hmm. And that, that's all it is. Innovation, creativity, all of that, that's all it is. It is the ability to make a plan to achieve the impossible right now. Not a plan like off in the future, I'm going to be able to do this. The ability to make a plan for the impossible right now. And honestly, that's the difference between somebody who gets dropped off in the middle of a jungle and survives a month later and somebody who dies right away. Because you have to be able to look at your environment and think of what you want. If you look up a tree and you're like, I'm going to build a hanging place for me to sleep up there. And then you, you know, that seems impossible, but you set your divergent, your, your convergent brain into figuring out a solution. You're going to figure out a solution. Absolutely. If you are immediately talking yourself out of being able to survive, uh, then you're not going to get anywhere. Yeah, you're not you're, going to survive. You're going to be laying in a pile of leaves, probably with carpenter ants. Yes. Um, I think that this is the thing that keeps not only creatives, but uh, uh, theoretical scientists passionate for years, decades, pursuing things that seem impossible now, but understanding that impossible is usually temporary. Yeah. I mean, look at the technology today. Just 10 years ago, a lot of this technology that we have today was science fiction. Totally. You 20 saw it on years, Star Trek. Yeah, 20 years before, that was even more science fiction. 30 years before, there was no concept for it whatsoever. Right. No concept. And people see the very beginning conceptual stages and the immediate responses, well, that's stupid and I can't see a use for that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like when uh, when uh, the the phones the first the first camera phones came out. Well, why do you need a camera on your phone? Right. You know, <laughs> there's just two separate things. There why do so you need th to combine? You them? know, honestly, back then I was one of those people. I was like, well, that's stupid. Why do you need a camera on your phone? I said the same thing. Now that's seen as innovative, right? Yeah. That invention actually was a dude that wanted to send a picture to somebody. There was no camera on the phone, no camera phones or whatever. And he was a programmer and he figured out a way to write code into the text message that would be able to send the picture in mm -hmm. pixels. That was it. That's fantastic. One of the most innovative things <laughs> out there. And it was really simple. It was thinking of something that was outside of the box and virtually impossible, allowing yourself to do, well, can I do this? That would be brilliant. And then setting your convergent brain into figuring out how to make it happen. That is innovation. That is creativity. And everyone can relearn being a creative genius. Oh, yeah, we, we do it every day. I mean, just because this isn't something that you're focused on. We all do it every any artist that you run into does this convergent, divergent thinking on their own without even realizing it. The, the whole idea behind the book was to just uh, put, a, put a light on it and to show people that like, hey, listen, this is what's going on whenever you're thinking. There are corporations right now that are saying that there is a lack of innovation, that there is a lack of creativity in their businesses and they don't understand why. And I'm like, because your business is regimented. Mm -hmm. You're not you're not helping with the creativity. You don't have harebrained ideas going out there. They get shot down right away. You're not rewarding that kind of stuff. You're not rewarding failure. You need to reward failure because guess what? 
most of your divergent ideas are going to crash and burn and fail miserably. That's a really good point to make. Failure is not rewarded in most uh, places and circumstances, and it should be because you really can't get anywhere without failing yeah, first. exactly. And I mean, that's one of the things that a lot of artists are afraid of when they first get started. They're afraid of failing. And failing is inevitable. Failure is growth. Failure is the the way that you tweak yourself and your being into uh, bringing something into existence that has never existed before. Fail, I, failure is showing yourself who you are and rewarding yourself for doing something new, for trying it out. Like I said before, I have never regretted, even back when I was like miserable corporate dude, I never regretted any of the failures of the things that I tried to do where I didn't give up on myself, where I just kept going. Absolutely. I, I kind of wish we could come up with a new word to make the distinction between failure, meaning this didn't work out and I'm still at it, and failure, meaning I'm giving up. I, th I feel like they should be two different things. Yeah. We shouldn't use the same word. <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, I think failure... If you were to take that and just make failure, failure, it is impossible to fail. Failure just means you giving up on you. Failure, meaning this didn't work out and I'm trying again, is like to be continued. Yeah, work exactly. Work in progress. It's a work in progress. That's all That's all failure is, is just a work in progress. I fail about a hundred times, which with every work of art that I create. I fail over and over and over and over. And eventually at the end, you know, I end up with something that I'm happy with and that is successful. So like, that's all it is. It's just a work in progress. Of little creative geniuses. Yes. That we are. Exactly. And that concludes this section of the audiobook. Thank you so much for listening, you guys. If you would like, you can proceed to the next section. Have an awesome day. Adios!